Hamas's interest is its people suffering, and people just don't talk about that. Apparently, 60% of the aid is being stolen by Hamas. Everything that goes through Gaza, they take an incredible amount of tax on that conveniently goes into the pockets of Hamas leaders and their mansions in Qatar. The Israeli side, the IDF, had more concern and, and care to Palestinian civilians than Palestinian leaders and international organizations themselves. They're going against those values because we're talking about Jews and they're revealing their anti-Semitism. And welcome everyone to our new episode of The Quad here in our new studios in Jerusalem. And with me, my wonderful co-host, Emily Schrader, human rights activist and journalist, and a returning guest co-host for the wonderful Shoshana Keats Jaskal, who's been very busy, she'll tell us all about it, who is the founder of Chokhmat Nashim, an organization fighting for women's rights in the Orthodox community. And our co-hosts, Ashira Solomon and Vivian Berkovich, are out of town, but will be back with us next week. And never forget to like, share, and subscribe. So, ladies, again, in the middle of this horrible war, it's been quite a week, but I think that the topic of this week, but every week there's a new topic to villainize Israel, of course. But I think the last week, the intensification of the criticism has been all around humanitarian aid. So mm. we had a couple of weeks when UNRWA was in the focus of the fact that they are completely useless at humanitarian aid. That's the, 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 the bright side of it. On the bad side of it, they're completely complicit mm -hmm. with a terrorist group, Hamas. But this week, we are being newly accused of a new blood libel, which is creating famine. Never mind the fact that there's many other places on Earth where there is famine. Uh, and at the moment, the, the current place where there's millions and millions of people are starving, starving is Sudan uh, as a result of their conflict. But no, 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 that never makes it to the news. Israel, apparently, we are not doing enough for the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And it turns out, we don't know, we'll discuss it right now, that we're creating a situation of famine. Emily, you are on the ground, you've been in Gaza, and you've been following this topic quite closely. What's going on? Is there a famine? I mean, I haven't been in Gaza in the areas where they claim that there's famine, full disclosure, so I don't know. There could be people who are starving. But is this a large-scale problem of famine? Of course not. And I think the part that's the craziest about the whole debate over humanitarian mm. aid has been that a lot of this came from pressure from the West, you know, uh, Europe and the United States this week, keep emphasizing how Israel must ensure that humanitarian aid is delivered to Gazans. Okay. Well, first of all, they need to ensure that our hostages are released. That yeah. should be priority They're not getting one. any aid from anybody. Yeah, they didn't even give them the medicine. Nothing. But aside from that, I don't think humanitarian aid should be conditional. I don't. Uh, so, fine. But the fact of the matter is, Israel has, in, even in the last few days, 8 million pounds of food, wow. just food, went into Gaza. Not are at the border, went into Gaza. How can there be a famine when you have 8 million pounds of food going in? Not to mention the fact that Israel has zero restrictions on the uh, entrance of humanitarian aid. They, uh, they are checking all of the trucks, but in terms of the amount that can go in, there is no limit. In fact, the UN and other humanitarian bodies, or NGOs, are not able to get all of the aid in that is being sent. Exactly. I hear there's like trucks waiting yeah. in the border not getting in because they don't have a sufficiently good distribution process. So from the reports that I've seen, basically there are dozens and dozens of trucks full with humanitarian aid that's already been checked by Israel. So it's been approved to enter, uh, but the distribution is the problem because the organizations that are on the ground working uh, don't have adequate protection from Hamas. As we know, Hamas has been stealing that aid and selling it at obscene prices to their own people in order to make money. And this is what they've done from day one. Everything that goes through Gaza, they take an incredible amount of tax on that conveniently goes into the pockets of Hamas leaders and their mansions in Qatar and who knows what That's what nobody's talking about. Apparently 60% of the aid is being stolen by Hamas. And like you said, being sold. I think we have a clip of aid being sold in the open market in Gaza at exorbitant prices. Please play. Bars and tins of food, all marked not for sale, are up for display at this market. It's very frustrating. These products should not be sold. They're meant to be humanitarian aid for civilians. 
So Shoshana, as an activist, how do you see the situation? First of all, I think that the idea of anyone starving is is, is horrible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel that it's, as much as we're very much here to defend Israel and to make sure that the truth gets out there, yes. it is important to say the idea of anyone starving as a result of this conflict is a terrible a terrible concept. Absolutely. And and as a mom, as a person, I, 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 I empathize. Mamash. I feel it's really important to make it clear, though, that like Hamas's interest is its people suffering. Exactly. Yeah. And and people just don't talk about that. It's it's upsetting to me because how are we going to you can't as an activist, if you don't name the problem, you cannot solve the problem. And so you could tell Israel, send more, send more, send more, send more. And if no one's dealing with the fact that Hamas takes it, then we're not actually solving the problem. And for me, I'm so much less interested in the blame game and so much more interested in just getting the aid to the people who need it so that Israel can actually do its job, get the hostages, and get the hell out. I mean, I personally would like this to be over. I'm sure you do as well. Get over as soon as possible. But it's being used as a bludgeon against us. Totally. And I I was at APAC last week and I went to one of the talks given by Mary Eisen, who's a friend of the show. We've had her on as a guest. And she frames things so precisely. And what she said that really stuck with me is that the suffering of the people of Gaza, a part of Hamas, <clears throat> a part of Hamas's defense strategy. Yeah. This is how they stay in power. This is how they continue to keep the hostages. I and mean, I think that's the problem with this whole war, that nobody can actually name the problem. Yeah. They're thinking of a million ways to justify yeah. why this war is happening, except for the real problem, which is that genocidal terrorists are in control and they don't care for anyone, not for their people or for our people even less. You know, I want to say something very honest that actually I spoke to you about before, and that is that I am frustrated as an Israeli when I see videos of Palestinians suffering, yeah, uh, when I see this mm. sort of war porn that they're sending out, and I'm frustrated not because one side is right or wrong. I'm frustrated because I can't yeah. know what's real. Yeah, and and I think this has been a problem in this conflict from day one. I am a, a very empathetic person. I I feel a lot for people. I speak out about a lot of human rights issues, sometimes even against Israel. Yeah. And I don't have a problem saying that Israel may be wrong or that Israel should do more, but I can't evaluate what's happening because there's so much disinformation. Yeah. And that's intentional. That's intentional by Hamas. And so when you see videos of people claiming that they're starving, at least in one of the cases that came out, there was someone who was terminally ill from an unrelated, right. from an unrelated uh, illness. And, and this video was going around accusing Israel of starving Palestinians. Right. In the meantime, we have videos coming, a lot of them from Arabic media, where there are children and people in the streets saying that other people are lying about the famine, uh, claiming that complaining about the food that they are receiving. Like, oh, I, gosh, I don't know what to believe. And that's really, really frustrating because what you said, the fact that someone may be starving as a result of this conflict is horrific. But how can we know what's real when everything that they are intentionally sending out is nonsense? Right. Well, if we're going to talk about what's real, what about the numbers from the Gaza Health Ministry? Oh, yeah. We know, I mean, they keep talking about 30,000 people. I think I've seen a few articles now with statisticians saying, very interesting how there's always many more women and children than the actual combatants. I think 70% or and, something outrageous. And it makes absolutely yeah. no yeah. sense when you look at what's going on in the population and when we know how many combatants we've neutralized, which is about 13,000. So even by the way, they haven't issued any numbers nothing. of combatants. No, oh, no, no. Of course not. not. None, everyone's not. Everyone's an innocent civilian. None of the 30,000 are combatants, yeah. and it turns out our one-year-old baby is, an, is a violent... A of course. A a a settler, violent, colonialist. Colonial, uh, settler. So whatever. We know the hypocrisy. We've read some of the data, which, which talks about the fact that the numbers are clearly artificially made, because every day, like, 200 people are dying every day. It's like every day is the same. And so I think that that that's something that we should really yes. focus on. What's real, as you say, and we see this with movies as well and clips, half of them are from Syria. Yeah. And what's mm. fake? So there's two things I'd like to say about that. Number one is a video that I saw. It it's claims that the woman went to buy flour, came back. At, maybe we can get the clip here. Came back and her she came back to find her entire family buried under rubble. And there's a woman and two press people with phones following her. So clearly staged. Curated, yeah. So clearly staged. Like, there's no smoke. There's no fire. There's a, it's a 
it's an old destruction and 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 people are eating it up and that's the second thing i want to say we have not just a battle with those making things up and making it so that people like you and i can't advocate because we don't know what's real but everyone just listens to it they accept it yeah. the acceptance because the thousands and thousands to. of retweets it's but it's because I everybody, everybody, it's in the eco chamber and anything that just reassures where your position is nobody's interested Bias in confirmation. Out and bias, how do you call it? Bias confirmation. Bias confirmation. Or confirmation that's, bias. Like confirmation, bias. Confirmation, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. No, no, no. That's what it is. It's confirmation bias and everybody's in their own bubble. The people who are anti are only seeing anti stuff. Yes. And us, to a certain extent, we're also seeing our things. But we know we have an army. We have a real ministry that actually yes. checks yes. the numbers, does the census, and tells the truth. And when that's we screw account. up, there are investigations. Yes. And when we screw up, there's we, there's accountability. And I think people really really forget that you know like everyone screws up this is war but at least we actually have investigations and yes they take longer than five minutes yes they take time yeah. because investigations do take time and that's why a thorough a real like investigation 500 people were killed from this bomb you're like well when did you count yeah in the last yeah. three minutes unbelievable so to elucidate a little bit about how things work with humanitarian organizations we have with us a friend of the show and a friend of us personally, and somebody who is a really relentless advocate for Israel, our good friend, Chen Mazig. We have with us Chen Mazig, who is an author, the founder of the Tel Aviv Institute, all-round rock star in so many ways, but when he was in the army, he actually served as the liaison to humanitarian aid organizations for COGAT. So first of all, Ken, I want to ask you a very simple, basic question. Please explain to our audience what COGAT is. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm such a big fan of you, Fleur, and uh, Emily for uh, forever. You both are amazing, and I just love seeing you um, every time you're on my screen. Um, the COGAT stands for the Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories. It's the um, humanitarian unit that works on all the civic aspects um, of the uh, armed combats um, and uh, any military activity from uh, the IDF. It was uh, created because of the understanding that there are civilians in uh, uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria and the Gaza Strip uh, where the IDF um, operates. So the goal of the unit is really taking care of the civil aspects, anywhere from sewage issues, um, environmental issues, uh, humanitarian issues, um, speaking with the counterparts on the Palestinian civic part, uh, leaders for the Palestinian society, understanding their needs and making sure that we minimize the effect of the war on those Palestinian civilians that are not combat combatants. Now, Khan, I wanted to ask you, I know that there's a lot of politics involved on the Palestinian side. Now, when it comes to Gaza specifically, even prior to this war, there were a lot of accusations that Israel doesn't allow electricity or Israel isn't properly giving them the tools to improve their sewage system. Who is to blame here? And, and what is COGOT doing um, that, you know, maybe uh, they're not doing enough of, in, in your opinion? Yeah, you know, I served for over five years. I was uh, um, in the West Bank in Hebron, Ramallah, Jerusalem. I also was stationed in Gaza for a short while. And during my time, I was able to see the corruption, true corruption from both the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian Authority, uh, and the international organizations, specifically the UN. I was working as a liaison officer to international organizations. Uh, I was working on developing projects like, like clinics and hospitals and um, roads, making sure that Palestinian lives would be improved. Um, but it was so challenging to get through um, this sort of projects uh, with counterparts that have such disregard to the Palestinian civilians' uh, best interests, and they just really don't care about them. And it seems often that the Israeli side, the IDF, had more concern and, and care to Palestinian civilians than Palestinian leaders and international organizations themselves. What type of corrupt corruption were you seeing from the international organizations that you can tell us about? Oh, I mean, the, the sort of um, dishonesty from the international organizations was really blunted. It was never um, reported. A anything that we were doing was never reported accurate, accurately. Um, they continuously lied about operations that we were doing to improve Palestinian lives. Uh, the, um, the international organizations um, have hired local Palestinian uh, staff like UNRWA 
And I remember working with UNRWA staff members, Palestinian staff members that I could tell, and I, based on the operation that we were working on together, that they were, um, they were part of something else. They were not working just for UNRWA, not, not just for the UN. Um, their interests were not Palestinian uh, well-being, but rather something else. And I, I don't want to say Hamas um, uh, surely, but in the recent months when more and more information came out of how many UNRWA employees were collaborating with Hamas, it made a lot of sense to me. Now, Ken, do you think, last question, do you think that this is what's happening now with the humanitarian aid debate going into Gaza? Is that is the fault on the UN side? You know, I saw that Israel's allowing unlimited aid that's actually not getting through because the UN hasn't been able to coordinate it uh, on the other end. And just to tack on to that, is there a famine going on? Is there a lack of food coming in? Or is it all just the narrative or just corrupt distribution? It's very hard to know what's truly going on in Gaza. We just saw yesterday when an Al Jazeera journalist were arrest, was arrested, um, information came out that he was actually praising Hamas on his social media. He was collaborating with Hamas. So all the information that comes out of Gaza should be um, taken with a grain of salt. Um, but what I want to say is that, you know, almost half of the population of Sudan, uh, 20 million people are facing uh, food insecurity. 48% uh, of them are children. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Somalia, uh, 36 million people in the, uh, in the Horn of Africa are facing uh, hunger. Um, in the Congo, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, 13 million children are facing um, food insecurity. It's not what about is This is the main issue. You know, we have uh, a conflict here. We have a war. Uh, and there's civilians that are impacted by it. No one should say that they're not. They're definitely impacted by it. And there is a humanitarian need. But it's very strange that while all those countries that I mentioned do not get any attention, they're not getting any airdrops from America, there's no ports being developed for humanitarian aid in Africa or in Afghanistan, or to make sure that these communities really are getting uh, the attention that they deserve, the Palestinians in Gaza are receiving a disproportionate amount of humanitarian aid. And again, it's not to say that they don't deserve it. They definitely deserve it. Every civilian that is impacted by a conflict, armed conflict, deserves to be attended by the international organizations. But it's very, it's very interesting why this specific community is getting all of the attention. And I think it's related to the sort of propaganda that is coming from Hamas and several other uh, parties that have um, bad interests in uh, framing Israel as, a, as an oppressor, framing this, this war in the sense of one, you know, Israel is the one causing all of this terrible, um, uh, um, horrific uh, uh, hunger and humanitarian crisis in Gaza, uh, I think all of this is, is meant to divert public attention. And there's real people that deserve this humanitarian aid, not only the Palestinians, definitely Palestinian civilians, but I think we need to look at it in a, in a macro uh, uh, level and understand that it's, uh, the things are, might be more nuanced and complicated than the, me than the media is trying to present. Well, unfortunately, that's what we're all fighting. And Ken, thank you for being really one of the best warriors we have with fighting those very false narratives. Mm -hmm. It's such a pleasure to have you on our show. Hopefully next time you'll come into the studio. Have a very successful weekend, thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. And now for our very, very popular scumbag segment and heroes, of course, we are continuing with the tradition of inviting fabulous people to come and join us in the studio for doing our scumbags and heroes. And this week, we have a very special guest, Yuval David, Yuval David, who is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker, host, producer, actor. You're in the thick of it in Hollywood, I'm aren't you? I'm in the thick of it, absolutely. And what do you, give us some hope? Can you give us some hope? I, I always lean towards hope. It's what our people do. When people hate us, when people attack us, we must always continue to fight forward. That's why I don't talk about fighting back. Whether it's in Hollywood, whether it's in our civil rights, social justice, human rights movements that truly are failing us in the most hypocritical ways, we always need to focus on the, the hope. So one of the things I talk about uh, often, especially on the speaking tour that I'm uh, very involved in around the U.S. and Canada, is we fight for life. We don't fight for death. The people who are trying to subjugate us, who are trying to kill us, not just physically kill us, committing genocide, but also those who are trying to commit historiocide, erasing our history, and ethnocide, erasing our ethnicity. We must love who we are and fight hate with love. 
we're going to win the war. We have won the war. That's why we say, Am Yisrael Chai. We are losing many, many battles, and we will continue to lose many battles, but we must always focus on the love for ourselves, for our families, our friends, our communities, and our people. And that's the hope. I love that. Amen, brother. And now with all that positivity, who's your scumbag? Oh, <laughs> yes. So, so... Gosh, you know what? I, I, I used to so much focus on positivity, and I would say, <laughs> if I don't have anything nice to say, I wouldn't yeah, say it. Well, you're on the, the wrong show. show. Yeah, 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 wrong show. I got it. I've watched your show. I get it. Totally wrong show. And also, uh, October 8th happened, not just October 7th. Right. So I very much uh, appreciate the, the shame campaigns that we're seeing across social media. So the scumbags do need to be shamed. I, and sadly, those scumbags are from my own LGBTQ community. Oh, okay. The drag queens who uh -huh. have created drag events in support of Palestine. Drags for the, Palestine. Which is so stupid and ridiculous. The LGBTQ communities and movements and organizations that have said that we support Palestinians and we are against Israelis and we are against Zionism. What these people have done is to go against our values, the values that they claim to fight for, they're going against those values because we're talking about Jews and they're revealing their anti-Semitism. So you know what? Even though I am very active within the LGBTQ liberal and progressive movements, I will always shame people who are doing things that are wrong. Yeah, they amazing. are the ones who I absolutely will call scumbags. Oh, thank you. Well, so, so well said. And this drags for Palestine. I mean, once I saw that, but, but here's, I thought we've lost it. I mean, we've lost but it. But here's the thing. The drag queens, I'm not even, you know, let me take their crowns off because they <laughs> don't deserve any royal crowns. Who are they? What are, what are their names? Who are their names? I looked up their names. I know a lot of drag queens. I know a lot of people who are brilliant and work hard to be who they are within their careers. I don't know a single one of them. So who the F cares? They are losers who are promoting <laughs> hatred and they're promoting their loser lifestyle. And in order to feel better about themselves, they're trying to bring other people down. That is not a hero. That is not a leader. A leader tries to do better and bring people up with them. A loser takes people down so they can feel better about themselves. Oh, so yeah. true. Thank don't you be so a loser. Much. Don't yes, be a loser. Don't be, be a, a winner. Yeah, and absolutely. even winners lose sometimes. Yet every athlete, this is a sport that we're in, a sport for the survival, so we can chant out Am Yisrael Chai. We are going to lose. We're not always going to do well. But we need to continue the fight forward. Not Amen. bringing people down, but bringing people up. I love it. And you're going to stay with us for the heroes. But Shoshana, who is your scumbag this week? I'm actually really glad you said what you said, because there is a power in looking at your own community Amen. and saying, OK, I love my community. I love my people. And therefore, I'm going to call out the worst of us so that we can be better as a group, because that's what nice. I do. That's what I do generally. And that's what I'm doing this week with my scumbag and hero. So I am an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> And I am a very proud Datiya, someone who's religious. Um, but there's a lot of bad stuff that happens, like in any community. Yeah. Uh, and people who do not follow the values, as you said, of our community. And so this week I'm focused on uh, Volvi Berkowitz, who is not giving his wife Malachi a get, a, a divorce, a Jewish Where divorce, from? in Kiryas mm -hmm. in, uh, in New York. Um, it's been four years. 20, she's 29 years old with two children. And for a 29-year-old Hasidic woman not to be able to get married and have more children, it's quite devastating. Absolutely. And, um, and it's wrong that she's being held hostage. And the entire community that's not helping the rabbis of the community, who I'm going to name because I think it's actually really important name to name names. Shame. name and shame, baby. Name, name and, and shame. shame. Rav Zalman Live Teitelbaum and his sons Rav Chaim Hirsch Teitelbaum and Rav Yaakov Bear Teitelbaum, they have the power that if they went to Volvi and said, free your wife, it would be done in a matter of an yeah, hour. So. 100% in the Hasidic. In the Hasidic community, there's no more tightly knit there's no community, right? right? No, no, no. This is the Rebbe says and, the, and the people do. And, do. Okay. and so th they are my uh, scumbags of the week. And I really believe that they can do tshuva, that they can do the right thing, and they can tell Volvi, give the get, and then they can both go on and live their separate lives and, and be happy. And that is the Jewish way. Okay. Amen. Amen. Those are my scum. And that's also the Jewish woman way, because our Jewish people are defined by our Jewish women. Well, we got to wait for my hero. You spoiler alert. Oh, am I ruining it? <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 that's great. I just love being here with strong women. Oh. I mean, my my best coaches 
uh, leaders, rabbis, yes. advisors have always been so, women. So next and time you're on the they patriot- are scumbags next, if they don't next, listen to next, the women. No. Next time you're on the patriotic, you can tell them that. Yeah. Emily, <laughs> who's your scumbag of the week? My scumbag is the United Nations. Oh, yes. that's all a big the United States. Like, like that's a really big bag. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. There's a different reason. They keep doing things, so there's a different reason we every week. Defenders. Yes, uh, I think I did UNRWA before, so yeah, now we're we're broadening it to all of the U.S. Yes, but uh, this or yesterday, they I think or a couple days ago, they began the U.N.'s conference on disarmament, and the presidency, mm. the chair of this very important conference of a very important global issue is, of course, the Islamic Republic of Iran. <laughs> Iran. That makes wow. perfect sense to have a regime which is murdering their own citizens, which is funding terror proxies, which has been violating every nuclear standard and moral and agreement and everything for the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, as long as they, as long as they could, as long as they have been trying to achieve nuclear power. Um, of course, only in the United Nations do you think that, that they should chair such a conference. So it's ridiculous. Uh, but then again, it's the UN. And that's what happens in the UN. So Emily, that's my scumbag. The world of the upside down. Yes, the UN. Thank you, Emily. They are repeat offenders. And I'm also going to be broad this week. My scumbag of the week is a man, but he represents a body, Joseph Borrell, who is the essentially foreign minister or policy, foreign policy chief of the European Union. Yeah, yeah. And he, of course, is appealing to the whole world and saying that we're the bad guys in what's going on in Gaza right now. Totally forgot, of course, that this all started with the 7th of October. And I really had some high hopes for the European Union because they were okay at the beginning mm -hmm. and they've gotten increasingly bad. And Joseph Borrell was in a foreign minister's conference and of course threw Israel under the bus as we thought that he always would. And it's just, you know, man, just look at the facts, see what's going on, understand who the real enemy is, and do the right thing. I know it's a lot, it's a tall order for the European Union, and especially for you. Uh, you're not known to be a friend of the Jews. Let's dare to say it. By whom? By the one that prevents humanitarian support entering into Gaza. By the lack of access by the acute insecurity inside Gaza. Insecurity in itself prevents uh, uh, distribution of support, of help, but the problem is that hundreds of talk, trucks are waiting in the border, and the ones who control the border prevent them from coming into. I'm coming from Washington, and I dare, I dare to say, well, yes, Israel is provoking famine. Maybe this is the moment to actually understand who the real bad guys are. Joseph Borrell, my scumbag of the week. I just want to double down on that really quickly because Joseph Please. Borrell has been the obstacle, one of, but the primary obstacle to designating the IRGC as a terrorist organization in the but EU. The For many years, the, Euro the European, the Iranian community has been begging him to take action. Other international leaders have been begging him to take action. And he's given out with this song and dance for months about how, oh, well, we need a proven case. Never mind the fact that the regime literally assassinated dissidents on the streets of, of Holland. But apparently that's not enough. Unbelievable. Josep Borrell doubling down. Stand by. <laughs> Plus. Okay, and now to complete the show with some of the positivity that Yuval injected when you walked through the door. Wow. Heroes of the week. Let's go and do your other half okay. of that coin. So, so Shana. Thank you. So the heroines of the week, Yay. actually, are the women fighting for Malki to get her divorce. Um, and I would say specifically uh, my friend Adina Sash, who is also known as, as Flatbush Girl on Instagram. Oh, I she, know. All right. She's amazing. Well, she, yes. There, there are very few people with whom I would not play chicken. She is one of them. Absolutely would lose every time. She is a force. She's incredible. And she called for a sex strike. Oh my God, I love this. What happened? In order to get Malki her debt, she called for the women to not be with their husbands for mitzvah night, which is generally Friday night. It's a tradition to be together, to be intimate. And she said, until Malki has her debt, mitzvah night is canceled. Nobody's getting wow. in. I, I, <laughs> no. I, and the truth is, she said, listen, 
this woman's been alone without intimacy, without partnership, without a, 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 par a husband for four years. We can't do one night oh, in her honor. What's the real so, goal is so to get so the husbands to feel a little bit uncomfortable and not not, to, not to, to make them suffer, but to say, our sister is suffering. Imagine one night is hard for us. Imagine what she's going through. Let's help her and let's work together, husband, to think, can I make a phone call together? Can I, make a, can I go to the Rebbe? Can I whatever? So the, the crazy thing is that she calls for the sex strike and everyone loses their minds. <laughs> I can't, you can't. I, I owe you the priority yeah. of these men. And yeah, the men. I mean, I speak, and I speak as, as a man. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, don't talk to our hearts. Talk to a different. <laughs> so I have been on more tele Israeli, Israeli television shows yeah. and radio shows. Galat, Moreshet, Karachat, it's like, Talking, talking about, about sex this strike. sex strike yeah. that I have in my whole 12, 12 year career of speaking of um, it Agonot. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Of course it's brilliant. It's a great That's what I said to the people inviting me. I'm like, why are you inviting me now? Because, because, because then all of a sudden sex is involved. Yes. Where have you been? Anyway, the point is that the women really took up arms and said, I'm sorry. Until Maki is free, no one is free, and y'all are going to work together. So I hope the next time I'm on the show, I can say that it worked, and Malki as or get. We'll see. You guys are my heroines. Amen. Wow. Love it. That's a quite a story. Yeah. What about you, Emily? Uh, so my hero of the week, who really could be every week, I guess since October 7th and even before, uh, member of Congress, Richie Torres. Mm. Oh, we From love day Richie. one, he's okay. been absolutely fabulous on Israel. And the thing that I love about him is that I... I don't agree with all of his policies. I don't agree with all of his politics, but he is a prime example of of leadership and statesmanship and being able to communicate with people who are different than you yeah. and being able to have civil conversations that actually advance understanding and advance dialogue. Uh, and there's very few political leaders like that today. Uh, and in addition to that, I think he has just been exemplary in, in how to be an ally to the Jewish community. You know, he's not from this community. But despite that, he recognizes that, you know, Israel is the only Jewish state. It's a state that its neighbors have tried to destroy completely for many, many decades. Hold on. Uh, and he isn't afraid to call that out, despite the fact he has been targeted by many of the more extreme mm -hmm. anti-Israel groups, anti-Israel movements. And, uh, and he's been very outspoken about that. And just this last week, this is kind of what caught my attention, uh, Chuck Schumer, a senator, U.S. senator, got a lot of criticism uh, for for his speech in which he basically called on Israelis to have elections and elect a new prime minister, which is really not appropriate, in my opinion, for a, a foreign lawmaker to be doing that Jewish or not Jewish. And Richie Torres, as an ally to the Jewish community, is an outspoken supporter of the state of Israel and its right to exist. He was asked about this particular incident in an interview. And instead of opining about things he doesn't really know or perhaps even shouldn't have an opinion on, and Richie Torres actually responded, well, you know, I think people are entitled to say whatever they want to say. That's freedom of speech. We have that in the United States. But when it comes to whether he should or shouldn't, that's really an issue for the Jewish community to decide. You know, Chuck Schumer is the highest ranking Jewish elected official in American history. So the subject of Israel is deeply personal for him. You know, and if you're Israeli or Jewish, then you have a personal stake in what happens domestically within Israel. But if you're neither Jewish nor Israeli like myself, you know, someone like me has no business weighing in on the domestic politics of Israel. I tell people I have my hands full with the messiness of American politics. I have no desire to inject myself into the messiness of Israeli politics. Finally, yeah. <laughs> finally, someone is saying that we have people left, right and sideways, you know, opining on what Zionism is or what anti-Semitism is or what the Jewish community should think or should feel or should do or shouldn't do. And they're not from the community. They don't have any stake in it. They're not involved in it. And so to have someone be like, I support you guys, it's your decision, yeah. is so relieving I to hear. It. Yeah, I really, it's, yeah. It's <laughs> wonderful. And I think what's really impressive about him is that he's very knowledgeable. Oh, yeah. He's well in the company. Yeah, that yeah. guy has read books. That guy's spoken to many different people. He really is because very so educated on this. He, he led with listening. That's what the woke movement started as before it became bastardized and, and went astray. The woke movement started with the complete understanding that I must be awake to who you are. I must listen Whoa, to yeah. who you are oh, and then say what you say, give you space. Yeah. That's what he said, which is brilliant. And like you said, more people need to do that in the United States. I have no, noble intentions of the woke movement and, and disastrous results, kind of like the UN. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, uh, just, just so she sent them all to Gaza. So yeah. 
my hero this week is actually a lady that I met yesterday. Um, her name is Nova Paris. She's an Aboriginal woman. She was the first Aboriginal Olympian to, to win a gold medal. Then she became oh, wow. a senator in Australia. She's a very... Underachiever. Mm. And let me just tell you, when I met her, she was so modest. I said, well, how do I introduce you? She's like, I'm just Nova. And I was like so humbled by her. But the reason why she's my hero is because the Aboriginal community in Australia have been actually very, very yeah. anti us, yeah. very anti Israel, have gone in lock, stock, and barrel with those woke and progressive idiots who don't know anything, really rabidly anti Semitic as well. And she is a lone voice in her community That's speaking pro Israel. And she was very specific because she said, when the Australian government wanted to pass a racist law on the fact that Australia was an empty country when they got here, it was the Jews that stood with us and got that law cancelled. And today I'm going to stand with the Jewish community the way the Jewish community stood with the Aboriginal community. But the reason she's my hero is because she's a lone voice in that wilderness of pro-Israel activism in the Aboriginal community. Your truth has been suppressed um, and it's seen in the wider community as something that's a, it's a myth that you have no connection to the land of Israel, but you know, us as First Nations people in Australia, we've never ceded our sovereignty. And, and like you, you've never ceded your sovereignty and you have that deep connection. And, and that's what I wanna do is, is to tell your truth. And so it was a pleasure meeting Nova. Thank you for being here in Israel and thank you for your advocacy for our people. And now to complete our wonderful show, please, Yuval, take it away. Who is your hero this week? After numerous advocacy meetings and very personal, intimate conversations from Knesset members and ministers to soldiers and wounded soldiers and commanders and people in the fight for our people, the heroes that I am admiring most are the parents and relatives of those who were killed, of the hostages who are still being held, of the group of Nova community survivors who I was with last night, who we put on an event where people got to dance and got to create art and got to be together. The people who understood that their traumas lead towards activism that they didn't choose to be activists. They might not have wanted to be activists. They might have never wanted to be leaders and most of them never wanted to be leaders, but they are now. How to be resilient and determined to not be defined by their trauma and their victimhood, but to be defined by their actions and how they move forward with all of that pain. They are heroes, they are heroic, they inspire us and they define us. Thank you, you beautiful, beautiful really beautiful. And on that note, we pray, as we do every week, that by the time next week's show comes along, all of our hostages will be back home. Amen. Thank you all.